Radio 786, 100.4 FM Stereo. Prime Talk, discerning, dissenting, tackling the crux of the conflicts and the controversies, dealing with the perspectives, the personalities and the politics. Prime Talk. Assalamu alaikum, good evening, welcome to Prime Talk, this evening presented by Anwar Sheikh. Nearly a decade after its propaganda campaign against Iraq, in which America and its cohorts claimed the country had weapons of mass destruction, Washington is at it again, this time accusing Iran of pursuing a military nuclear program. Iran has repeatedly refuted the allegations, arguing that as a member of the International Atomic Energy Agency and a signatory to to the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, it has the right to develop and acquire nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. Nonetheless, in recent months and years, Iran has seen its nuclear scientists assassinated, sanctions imposed, and threats of a military strike. Iran, however, has not sat back. It has demonstrated its military and intelligence capabilities and late last year downed a US spy drone and captured CIA operatives. As the situation hots up, are we witnessing a similar narrative to Iraq uh, Iraq playing out, or could it be far more dangerous? To analyze, examine this and more, we're joined by political analyst Professor Said Muhammad Marandi, joining us from uh, Tehran. Professor Marandi, are you with us? Yes, sir, I am with you. Thank you very much for joining us here at Radio 786. Also joining us in the program this evening, freelance journalist and staff writer at Veterans Today, Joshua Blakeney. Mr. Blakeney, are you with us? I'm with you. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks for joining us on the program this evening. Okay, let's look at the recent uh, developments um, in in the Persian Gulf or regarding the, the Iranian showdown with the West. Of course, uh, big in the news has been the assassination of the nuclear scientist, uh, Mr. Mo, uh, Mustafa Ahmadi Roshan, and of course, uh, the victim of a bomb attack in, this, in Tehran. Um, and maybe we should start our program this evening by looking at the methods and tactics used um, to uh, counter Iran's development of nuclear technology by America, Israel, and some other countries. Would you say that there is, maybe I should go to uh, Mr. Marandi, Professor Marandi first. Would you say that the tactics have now shifted to covert action, including the use of terrorism to discourage Iran, Iran from its program? Professor? Uh, well, I think that uh, terrorism uh, has is um, has been recently added for this particular purpose, in the sense that a number of scientists, including one of my colleagues uh, at the University of Tehran, who was uh, assassinated over a year ago, um, th- this this has been more recently used to kill nuclear scientists and academics. But terrorism uh, by the United States and the Europeans has been used for over three decades. Uh, they have supported terrorist organizations like the um, so-called Mujahideen uh, al the MEK or MKO as some call it, um, uh, the uh, terrorist ter- uh, PKK or PJAK, uh, as well as uh, terrorist organizations like um, uh, the Jundullah in Sistan and Baluchistan. So terrorism has been a tool that has been used for decades, and the irony is that um, some of these terrorist organizations, like the Mujahideen uh, al they have killed um, between 12 to 16,000 people, depending on which statistics you use, but they've also been mercenaries for Saddam Hussein for over two decades. And um, Western governments um, allow them to have offices under different names in European countries as well as in the United States. And they are effectively equivalent to Al-Qaeda for Iran, Al-Qaeda. Yet, uh, if let's imagine that Iran was to open such an office for Al-Qaeda in Tehran, what would the reaction of Western countries be? So it is 
uh, in a sense, new, but it has also been a method that has been used for decades now against uh, ordinary Iranians and civilians. Mm. Can I, can I <clears throat> maybe bring uh, Mr. Blakeney in here? Um, we have seen denials from, um, you know, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, and also Leon Panetta, the... Um, you know that that the, the U.S. has not been involved in these uh, acts, um, but but we've not seen any condemnation. In fact, Iran has found it very difficult to get the UN to um, get a resolution to condemn these attacks, which is not a once-off, but has been as as has proven to be a, a sort of an ongoing pattern with three previous uh, assassinations having taken place. Um, is the U.S. giving sort of tacit approval for this type of action? Yeah, it's particularly surprising viewing events in the United Nations and seeing Ban Ki-moon, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, be so one-sided uh, when it comes to the Iranian issue. And uh, as Professor Morandi uh, time and time again uh, states, that I Iran is the, the victim invariably and the, uh, the perpetrator of terrorism and violence in the Middle East and, of course, destabilization in the Middle East is uh, the U.S. and, and Israel. Uh, I'm doing my um, graduate studies here in Canada on the events of 9-11, and I can tell you that the whole war on terror is premised on, uh, you know, state-sponsored terrorism done by the United States. Hmm. Yes, so it's not surprising that Hillary... Was She's part of a political establishment that has been complicit in terrorism at home as well. And uh, I think that we have to understand the events as they're unfolding in the Middle East as being situated um, in the context of the rise of the Likud in the late 70s and the um, establishment of the Sharon Doctrine in the 1980s, which stated that Israel uh, wanted the Middle East to be weakened and destabilized and broken down the religious statelets. If we look, for example, at Iraq now, it's kind of been broken down along sectarian uh, lines, And I think this is what Israel aspires for in Iran. And unfortunately, um, the U.S. Middle East policy is, uh, has in recent history been dictated by uh, pro-Israel lobbyists. There is a faction in the U.S. ruling class uh, personified by a Brz Zbigniew Brzezinski or um, other sort of traditional U.S. empire builders, George Bush Sr. or Brent Scowcroft, who would perhaps look at Iran and say that would be an obvious ally uh, for the American empire because the American empire should be fighting Russia and China, you know, real global uh, threat to U.S. hegemony. Um, there's another faction in the U.S. Elite, uh, who are invariably viewing the world through Israel's spectacles, who uh, are very highly partisan to the state of Israel. Uh, and such people, they want to uh, weaken uh, Iran and break down Iran and, and attack Iran. Um, and all Middle East uh, potential hegemon, so Israel can retain uh, regional hegemony. And so I think it's important when we say the U.S., we define uh, what we mean and, and acknowledge that there's different factions in the U.S. ruling class. We've also seen uh, in an article in Foreign, uh, foreign Policy by um, Mark Perry uh, this week uh, an expose of uh, Mossad agents masquerading as CIA agents, which shows that there is this uh, kind of tension what are the best interests uh, and those of the state of Israel? You know, seeing as we're uh, talking to an audience in southern Africa, perhaps the analogy would be uh, Rhodesia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the British Empire. Uh, there came a stage in 1965 where the British Empire wanted to do uh, self-governance in Rhodesia, and you had Ian Smith and local elites who didn't like that, and they did a unilateral, unilateral declaration of independence. The interests of the local uh, uh, white elites in, in Rhodesia began to contradict those of the imperial metropolis. Likewise, now in the Middle East, whereas the U.S. traditionally uh, wanted to foster stability in the Middle East for its oil markets, uh, those interests are running up against those kind of crazed uh, ethnic nationalists on the Israeli right who want to weaken and balkanize the Middle East. And I think that uh, because Iran is not a broken-backed and dilapidated country like Iraq, because Iran has uh, a military uh, capacity to defend itself, uh, we're having to see, we're seeing kind of a, a new Cold War emerge where uh, Israel is uh, employing tactics like uh, taking out a scientist, you know, assassination or uh, uh, sponsoring uh, proxy groups to go into. 
and, and weaken the country from within. Mm. Yeah, Professor Marani, the um, of course extremely hypocritical if one considers that um, you know the war of terror has been raised as the most serious challenge face facing uh, America, um, and then you know tacitly sort of going along with this type of uh, action. Um, you know, all fingers seem to be pointing at Mossad. I mean, uh, 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 Mr. Blakeney has just now mentioned the false flag operations of Israel, where they have posed as CIA agents and recruited members of the Mujaf Munafik in Khalk, um, or the, this terrorist group, um, to do its uh, dirty work inside of, 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 uh, of Iran. What, what would you say, what, what is Iran's response going to be to this ongoing pressure? I mean, on top of, you know, coming after a spate of sanctions from the United Nations, also, at the moment, the current threat of sanctions on its oil exports. Um, how do you see Iran responding to this onslaught? Well, regarding the fa false flag operations and the recent article uh, by Mr. Perry, uh, basically the information that he has obtained is uh, the sort of information that the U.S. government would give to him. And it is clear that the Americans had this information for a very long time. In other words, the Americans knew quite well what the Israelis were doing, and therefore they are deeply implicated, even if they were not indirectly involved in the terror attacks. Mm -hmm. It's not as if the Americans don't know what Israeli agents or um, or um, people within the uh, Israeli uh, security apparatus are doing. It's not as if Americans are not informed about that. Uh, we have to keep in mind that um, Iran has been, as you pointed out, under assault from uh, another a, a number of perspectives. Uh, one is that um, Iranians have been un under sanctions for decades, and recently the United States has uh, increased those sig sanctions significantly by imposing uh, sanctions on the central bank, as well as an embargo on the oil industry. And uh, Ron Paul, the U.S. Pres presidential candidate, among many other people, says this is effectively an act of war. So what the United States is trying to do, and so is the European Union, is to strangle the Iranian economy. In the past, the United States and Western European countries claimed that uh, their sanctions were directed at the government. Although WikiLeaks documents effectively, effectively proved that this was not the case, and from the very start, the objective was ordinary Iranian people, but now it's quite blatant when they say they want to tighten the noose on Iran, that means they want to suffocate and strangle the economy, in other words, make ordinary people suffer and uh, lead lives of misery. Mm. So this, in addition to drones flying over Iranian airspace, uh, this in addition to terror attacks, this in addition to the constant threats of war against the Iranian people, uh, these are all show that it is the Western countries uh, led by the United States that um, are uh, aggressive towards Iran. And so far, Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, has been very measured and balanced in response. The, the position that the Iranians are taking now is that as long as um, the Islamic Republic of Iran is left to itself, <coughs> it, is, uh, it exports its oil, it has no problem with an embargo by the United States or the Europeans. But if the United States tries to impose its will on third countries and prevents Iran from exporting oil, and regimes uh, proxy or regimes uh, aligned to the United States, um, such as Saudi Arabia, let's say, they go along with the United States and try to drive Iran out of the market, that would effectively mean that the Saudis and them are collaborating with Americans and behaving aggressively towards Iran. If that is the case, then the Iranians will be forced to retaliate. It's just like a human being. If you try to strangle a human being, a human, that person will react uh, harshly. It's an issue of survival. So uh, the Iranians want peace and stability in the Persian Gulf region, but if the United States and, other, and the uh, regime, its client regimes in the region attempts to to prevent Iranians from living 
uh, ordinary lifestyle, an ordinary lifestyle, and living in, and live in peace, then uh, they will definitely face the consequences. Mm. And having mentioned, you know, the possibility of closing the, the Straits of Hormuz, uh, Mr. Blakeney, do you think the attempts to um, get third countries um, like China, India, etc., to uh, join the embargo on oil, um, Iranian oil, do you think um, the U.S. will be successful in getting those countries to um, stop importing oil from Iran? No, I don't think they will. And I think that's really the here is that we're living in a multipolar world these days. Uh, you know, many will recall that the one of the key uh, intellects of war on terror was an individual named Charles Krauthammer, who in 1990 produced a, a paper uh, called the Unipolar Moment, in which he argued that the moment, just as the Soviet Union had, had declined that, you know, in the 90s, that the U.S. had a unity to want well upon uh, other countries uh, and that that moment has been lost now and in a multipolar world we're living in an era where the rise of china is the topic du jour and i even this week i believe china has, has uh, reaffirmed their uh, unwillingness to acquiesce to the uh, uh, embargo on iran and so um, those uh, countries who have traditionally been uh, colonized or who have traditionally been threatened by big imperial powers now have uh, options to uh, uh, trade with different uh, powers in the world, different global hegemons. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's for the multipolar world. Certainly we see um, increasing ties between uh, Venezuela and Iran, uh, between China and Iran, and I think that, that irritates those who would like to see Iran uh, become like Iraq and, and, and be uh, stuck in civil war and internal sectarianism. Uh, if Iran can trade, it can bring wealth in, which will lead to the betterment of its people, which will lead, uh, which will mean the Iranian people will continue to embrace the, Ira the Islamic Revolution, uh, and and that's not what uh, those who want to control the people and resources of the Middle East want. And so I am very uh, sanguine about the fact that China and other powers are are continuing trade uh, with Iran. We see also in Syria, for example, that Russia aren't too happy about attempts to deal Syria. So uh, this multipolar world is certainly something that, 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 that that's a positive force for humanity, I think. Mm. So if in the end those countries don't support the oil embargo, uh, Professor Marandi, uh, do you think it will have any effect? Uh, I mean, if, if, if it ends up being the U.S. and its allies, uh, U.K., France, um, will, will it really have an effect on Iran? And, and will that maybe serve to embolden or to anger the U.S. further, you know, so as to maybe consider further action, perhaps the threat of military action? Well, it's difficult to tell, really. The United States is basically um, um, pressuring uh, countries like uh, Japan and Korea, uh, as well as certain members of the EU, to uh, stop um, importing oil and doing a trade with Iran. Um, the, the law passed by uh, the U.S. Con Congress and Senate and, and signed by the uh, by Obama effectively prohibits third countries from doing trade with Iran and it's, it's very much in line with um, uh, the idea of empire where the Americans dictate their terms to the rest of the world and countries must seek waivers or permission from the United States to do trade with Iran. Uh, there are countries nowadays that uh, refuse to uh, acknowledge such blatant American hegemony, and I don't think, therefore, that many of Iran's partners will um, in any way or form decrease their oil imports. In fact, I think that some countries that are more independent-minded may even attempt to increase Iranian oil imports uh, because a strong Iran is, uh, is in the, it benefits them and decreases American global hegemony. Mm. But there are countries that I'm sure will try to decrease their imp uh, imports from Iran in order to appease uh, uh, the regime in Washington or because they're aligned to uh, the American regime. Mm. And uh, therefore, it, there is potential for difficult, some difficulty in Iran. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't think that at all they will succeed because there is not excess capacity to produce oil contrary to what 
American sale. It's FA. Mm. It's very difficult for the Saudis to maintain current exports, and it's, it remains to be seen if they can export more. But uh, if the United States tries to move a step forward and initiate military conflict, I think that um, that would be um, that would be a tragedy for for the whole world. Not only because war is a tragedy, and uh, it would be a continuation of criminal action on behalf of the United States over the la last decade in the Middle East, uh, meaning war after war, but, uh, but also I think it would be uh, a created disaster for the global economy, because without a doubt, oil will no longer be exported through the Strait of Hormuz, nor northern Iraq, nor uh, Central Asia, and I think it will create major upheavals throughout the region. Uh, mm -hmm. The Americans try to claim that the Iranians will not would not be able to close the Strait of Hormuz, but I think that's the same miscalculation that the Israeli regime made when it tried to invade southern Lebanon, they, and they were soundly defeated by Hezbollah. Iran, since the axis of evil speech, has been preparing itself for such a day, and from the very northern tip of the Persian Gulf to the very southern tip, and in the Indian Ocean. It, is, it has prepared itself for such an eventuality. Mm. But hopefully there are some reasonable people within the United States elite who recognize that this will do immense damage to uh, the American people as well as other people in the world and prevent the regime from making any foolish um, attempts at escalating the current situation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Professor Marandi, um, let's look at the role of the uh, of the Saudis. Uh, now, the Saudis have agreed, um, uh, or at least have indicated that they will pick up on the lost um, uh, oil production on the world market should uh, Iran's um, oil be embargoed. Um, what what do you think is Saudi Arabia's role? Um, well, the Saudi regime is a client regime. It is not uh, an independent country. It is a uh, it is a ruling family that has uh, named the country after itself, unlike other countries in the world. It um, the ruling family takes most of the oil wealth for itself. Therefore, there is a great deal of anger among ordinary citizens in the country. It has millions of. Um, effectively slaves, just like in the United Arab Emirates and Qatar. You have millions of people who have absolutely no rights in those countries, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from the Philippines, uh, who work as slaves in these countries. These people are not uh, happy with the status quo. Mm. You have princes uh, at each other's throats uh, because uh, the current king, Abdullah, is very old and quite ill. And you also have uh, the Saudi regime has immense trouble with uh, with Egypt because it supported Mubarak. It has mm. immense trouble with Yemen, which has a population even greater so than Saudi Arabia, because it has supported the dictatorship there. Mm. It has problems uh, in Bahrain because it uh, it has occupied the country and is um, and the people there are, are are constantly protesting. And it has um, uh, very poor relations with with Iraq. Mm. So intensifying tensions with Iran would make the situation very difficult for the Saudi regime. Mm. But at the same time, the Saudis are, are very close to the Americans, and um, they are effectively in an unwritten alliance with Israel and the United States to weaken the resistance against Israel mm. and to attempt to weaken Iran. But again, it's, it's unclear if the Saudis really can increase oil production, but it is it, the very idea that they try to do so mm. and to replace Iran and to shut Iran out of the market shows that how close they are to Israel and the Americans. But mm. again, if the Saudis go down this route, then uh, effectively the Iranians will have no option but to respond in kind. Mm. Yeah, um, Mr. Blakeney, well, Saudi Arabia, obviously a country with not much of an independent foreign policy, but there is another country in the region that has a very independent foreign policy, which is, of course, Russia. And Russia's deputy foreign minister says that Moscow is against any military strike or escalation of international sanctions against Tehran, as such measures will only aggravate the existing situation. How do you think um, Russia's role will play out in, 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 in this continuing uh, saga? <clears throat> well, 
Uh, well, hopefully that w the existence of a powerful Russia in the region will uh, offer those who are, whose countries are being meddled uh, with uh, mm. the option of trading and um, creating relations with uh, countries other than the United States and Israel. And so I think in a way it would be a positive uh, factor as long as they, they didn't then escalate and start doing military interventions, although, you know, Russia hasn't sort of historically done that really, and, you know, if we exclude World War II. And so uh, I think, as I say, that, you know, this, uh, this multipolar world that we're living in is a positive one, that all the uh, implications of uh, meddling in Iran that uh, Professor Morandi uh, so exceptionally adumbrated for us mm. uh, uh, begs the question, why, why are the United States doing this? And this is what I've been concerned with in my mm. job, uh, you know, wh why does the U.S. do this? And I think that does come back to the fact that Israel has proxies in the United States who have been conspiring for decades to see the U.S. shift its uh, foreign policy in an irrational way, one that goes against its interests. And, uh, and I think that that, that is a, uh, a question that we need to contemplate. Why would the U.S. do all these things that are clearly and unambiguously negative for it to be doing? And I think that Israel is the answer for that, that in the United States, uh, a significant segment of the elite, uh, that first and foremost, they have an allegiance to the state of Israel. They're, they're partisan to Israel. And that has the U.S. having an uh, asymmetric foreign policy, which is going against its interests in the Middle East. Obviously, if Iran now is turning to China and Russia and Venezuela, the it's out of the United States of other imperial powers or other uh, global uh, that, that's against states' interests, and, you know, just as the British Empire, one by one, by one lost its colonies around the world and its empire uh, capitulated, so uh, it would seem that the, the era of American empire is, is, is gone. It's declining now, the American empire, and it's losing its uh, former uh, indirect colonies one by one. And so, uh, interestingly, here in Canada, I live in the oil patch of Canada, and you see how the Canadian Prime Minister is so one-sided on Israel, because if the Middle East oil markets are to be lost by the American empire and are to be destabilized, uh, you're going to see the United States purchasing a lot of its oil from the Alberta tar sands here in Canada, and that will be pumped through the Keystone XL pipeline down into the States. And so it's interesting seeing the relationship between the United States and the Alberta tar sands here at the East is beginning to be reconfigured, uh, uh, premised on, on this post-9-11 uh, Middle East policy of interventionism and smashing up the Middle East, which uh, surely if one owned an oil company, they wouldn't want to go into a, a country that has civil war and invest, they tell their investors they, they're moving that oil company into a country that's you know, stuck in internal sectarianism. Typically, oil companies have wanted stability. Typically, the, the U.S. policy in the Middle East was one of, of market imperialism. You know, the U.S. has many ways of controlling countries, and interventionism is only one of those. But for the Zionists, unfortunately, they, they want uh, Middle East regimes to be weakened. You know, in 1991, Saddam Hussein fired Scud missiles at Tel Aviv, and, you know, this is the product of U.S. sponsoring Arab strongmen. You know, if the U.S. Uh, funnels its uh, U.S. dollars into Arab and Muslim regimes in exchange for resources, that's fine for those who are ensconced in Houston and Dallas uh, oil companies. You know, they don't have to feel the wrath of those Middle East uh, dictators or Middle East elected governments in the case of the Iranian government. But in the, for Israel, that's uh, highly uh, deleterious because those Middle East regimes who receive uh, U.S. sponsorship can turn on Israel, and in the case of Saddam Hussein, even fire Scud missiles at them. And so I think it's important to illuminate the contradiction between uh, U.S. Middle East policy as it was traditionally conceived, you know, since the kind of Eisenhower doctrine of the 50s, uh, and, and that post 9-11, which is quite different. And we see the decline of U.S. empire being the product, which does suggest that U.S. Middle East policy has been ill-conceived. And I would argue that that's largely because the neoconservative movement who initiated this foreign policy uh, were, were predominantly viewing the world from uh, the perspective of Tel Aviv. Uh, and they tried to sell to the U.S. people and to the U.S. elite Tel Aviv's interests as being synonymous with those of Washington, when actually I think that that, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Just to remind you, you're tuned to Radio 786. The program is Prime Talk. We have with us this evening Professor Said Muhammad Mirandi <clears throat> and also freelance journalist and staff writer veterans today, Mr. Joshua Blakeney. We're going to take a brief break quickly now, uh, but join us after this break. And remember, you can SMS us in the studio. I'd like to hear from you. The number is 32783. Please send me your comment, your question. Um, 32783 also very welcome after the break to call us in the studio the number in the studio 021 6991 786 6991 786 see you on the other side of this radio 786 100.4 fm stereo prime talk discerning dissenting Tackling the crux of the conflicts and the controversies. Dealing with the perspectives, the personalities and the politics. Prime Talk. Welcome back to Prime Talk. Um, this evening we're looking at the crisis in the Persian Gulf, threats of Iran, assassinations, drone uh, espionage on Iran. And we have on the program this evening Professor Said Mohammad Marandi, also uh, Mr. Joshua Blakeney, freelance journalist and staff writer, veterans today. Uh, Mr. Blakeney, just a, uh, another uh, maybe aspect of this um, discussion that I want to touch on is the response of Republican hopefuls to the recent assassination. Now we have had uh, sort of a cheer, a cheerleading, sort of uh, you know applauding the action from some of them, uh, encouraging more. Um, uh, you know, how, how do you see? Um, uh, you know, is Iran being used as a as a as a campaigning uh, issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, what we're seeing where these uh, Republican leaders are trying to you know, have a competition of who can be the most anti-Iranian, uh, you know, that's a symptom of the that U.S. politicians uh, rely on uh, money from individuals who are partisan to Israel. The, I think it was uh, the Washington Post did an article, uh, the, the journalist's last name was Cohen, did an article in which he, 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 he deconstructed the funding of U.S. political parties, and I believe the Republican Party at that time, which was in the 1990s, he, he deduced that they were receiving 35% of their, their funding from individuals who were very wealthy, you know, Jewish philanthropists, whose uh, what one could surmise priority is, is the, uh, the state of Israel. Mm. Um, these politicians are not only vying for votes, but for, 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 and, and therefore we see um, those who are running for the leadership of the Republican Party uh, you know, in competition with each other for who can make the most anti-Iranian statements. And it's almost embarrassing to see that. I mean, you know, the, 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 the transparency um, of, of these uh, individuals. And luckily we have Ron Paul uh, amongst them, the cat among the pigeons, who's uh, offering a different perspective, a, a more isolationist perspective, in which he argues that the U.S. should uh, withdraw from the Middle East and withdraw its, Middle East, its, its U.S. military bases around the world a perspective of, I think, an increasing number of U.S. citizens and the world citizens uh, are endorsing. Mm. And, of course, the, the comment from Rick Santorum uh, that uh, the assassination of Iranian uh, civilians being, quote, unquote, a wonderful thing. Yes, again, I mean, I think that he, he knows, you know, we have a phrase like he knows what side his bread is buttered on, you know, he knows... Uh, where his funding is coming from, and therefore uh, these kinds of uh, venal statements are, are symptoms of, of, of a, a political system that is highly susceptible to lobbying and to uh, the rich. It would appear in the United States that whoever has money, you know, has political clout. And, and it would appear that uh, there are um, many individuals who are partisan to the state of Israel who basically buy uh, politicians' uh, Middle East policies for them. They, they say, okay, well, if you uh, prioritize Israel's interest in the Middle East, and often they're sold to U.S. politicians as being synonymous with those of the United States, but I would argue that the United States has other ways of, you know, influencing the Middle East, less violent and less militaristic, less misanthropic ways of inf influencing the Middle East. Um, so, like, when Gaddafi was taken out, you know, that there was some in the U.S. elite who didn't support that because Gaddafi had actually already sold out to U.S. corporations. But yet we saw Gaddafi being ousted and deposed and, and his country being destabilized. And one 
as to ask whose interest that, that, that's in. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you look at the documentary record going back to the 1980s, it's quite clear that the tanks in Israel that pr- were producing documents, such as Oded Ginon's paper, A Strategy for Israel in the 1980s, that was arguing that they should balkanize the Middle East based on the military system of the Ottoman Empire, where they break down the Middle East into ethno-religious statelets. Uh, so the Middle East is divided and ruled, just as the you know, American Empire expanded into Indian territories and put them onto reservations. Or in South Africa, they tried to put the natives onto Bantu sand. So the Israelis want the Middle East broken down into ethnic or religious statelets, like we see in Iraq now. It's largely something that's been balkanized whereas under Saddam Hussein it was unified. They would very much like that for Iran, for Iran not to be so uh, unified and strong. They would like Iran to be broken down and for uh, the oil-rich and uh, resource-rich parts of Iran to secede from the uh, greater body politic. Uh, they tried to do that in Venezuela, too, incidentally, to try and get the oil-rich region of Venezuela to secede from Venezuela. And so this attempt to, to balkanize countries ought to be resisted, and I think... The Iranian government, as it has an option to trade with as many countries as it wants, uh, as long as those countries don't go along with this illegal uh, uh, act of war against Iran, um, that Iran will continue to prosper and its people will uh, receive some of that prosperity, which is bad from the perspective of those who don't want a strong Iran, who want a weak and destabilized Iran. Mm. Mr. Marandi, do you think um, they're making headway, though? Do you think the U.S. is really making progress? If, if this is, as uh, Mr. Blakeney is saying, if, if, if this is the, the, the real goal um, of, of, the, of, of the West and of Israel, um, are they really succeeding? Because, you know, if we look at the, um, very recently uh, the capturing of a CIA spy, um, the commandeering of an Iranian drone, um, it does seem that Iran is sort of, very capable of 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 conf- of, of, of countering um, these efforts from the U.S. Yes, I mean the, the the capture of the highly sophisticated military drone by the Iranians is um, is a major uh, achievement. And as you pointed out, the numerous uh, CIA agents that have been arrested also show uh, the shortcomings of U.S. intelligence as well as the strengths of uh, the Iranian counterintelligence. Um, uh, it's it's clear that the United States is and European regimes are on the decline, uh, and one reason because behind their extraordinary hostility is, I think, because of this decline. In other words, they are sort of like um, uh, drowning people who are uh, trying to grasp a hold on to anything available. Uh, they, uh, what is basically left of the, I'm not saying that the United States has no uh, economic strength or that the Europeans but, uh, do not either, but they are declining very rapidly. And that which they do have at their disposal, especially the Americans, is a very strong military, and they use that to threaten other countries. Mm-hmm. But I think that um, a couple of things that I would like to add. And one is that the United, the, the Democrats and the Republicans are really no different from one another. Obama is, uh, when it comes to Iran, has been just as criminal as uh, Bush has. Uh, he has uh, attempted to increase sanctions, and as I said, as I said earlier, Ron Paul has effectively called uh, U.S. policy an act of war. He has uh, the assassinations over the past two, three years uh, have been carried out uh, under his presidency. Uh, the uh, increased sanctions, the, the, the spying, the, uh, the flying of drones over Iranian airspace, this is all being done under his presidency. Now, regardless, let's forget the fact that drone attacks are being carried out in Yemen and Somalia and Pakistan, and in it, thousands of innocent people have been slaughtered at the direct order of uh, the U.S. government, and that means, at the end of the day, the U.S. president. Uh, I think it was Chomsky who said that uh, Bush used to capture these people and take them to notorious prisons, and Obama effectively uh, murders them. That's, that's the difference between the two. Mm. And I also think it was Chomsky who also said that the United States is a single-party state with two, with two factions, the Republicans and the Democrats. So um, there's really not much of a difference between the two parties. And I think that Iran's strength basically also lies in its own people, 
and its reliance upon it as itself. It's true the Iranians uh, welcome any cooperation that comes from any country like China or India or Pakistan uh, when it comes to dealing with the United States and doing trade. But at the end of the day, any nation that wishes to stand independently has to rely on itself. And I think that that is something that many of us have learned from the experience of the South African people under apartheid. When uh, Western countries considered uh, the uh, protesters and, and the political movements that oppose apartheid South Africa as terrorist organizations, and when they supported apartheid South Africa, the, uh, the African majority and the other uh, um, minorities in the country, as well as a significant number of uh, whites who uh, rejected the idea of apartheid, they continued their struggle on their own feet and on their own terms until they uh, brought down uh, the apartheid regime. And therefore, if a nation is, is to really, really remain independent and to really stand upon its own feet and face aggression like that which Iran is facing today, it has to rely on itself. Mm. Mr. Blakeney, um, for all the talk during the Obama campaign, um, you know, uh, th there was also mention made that uh, Obama would would engage in dialogue with, uh, with with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Unfortunately, what we've seen is a complete turnabout, and uh, one of, I, I suppose, one of the the the, the, the most uh, profound examples of not keeping his promise. Um, he, he certainly. Um, take it, taken it upon himself to ratch up the, um, the, the tension against Iran. Um, as, as, as Professor Mirandi said now that we are practically, they are practically, the U.S. and Israel are practically at war with, with Iran. Uh, do you think there's still any chance um, for, for, for dialogue, uh, for some sort of dialogue to, to come about between Iran um, and America? Or is, or is the, 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 the powers, you know, the, the lobby groups, um, the military industrial complex just simply too powerful for Obama to, to really make any breakthrough? Well, if uh, more and more people in the United States begin to become conscious of the uh, negative impact these uh, militarists and lobbyists are having on, US, uh, on the U.S. political system, it's like interesting seeing, you know, Ron Paul increasingly galvanizing the population in the United States and hopefully his anti-war message uh, will continue to, to gain popularity. I don't, I'm, I'm someone who considers myself to be left-wing, but I also recognize that whilst I might disagree with Ron, uh, you know, domestic economic policies, uh, that certain, it's a significant um, development to have someone who's anti-war, um, you know, on the political podia in, in the United States. I think it's highly, uh, it's highly significant. But I think um, uh, Professor Morandi made some very, very important points, but I would also argue that um, we should be careful not to attribute too much power to uh, uh, Barack Obama. I mean, as we saw with John F. Kennedy's assassination, if a president actually tries to usurp power and tries to uh, actually change, uh, change the world and change the United States, they'll invariably feel the wrath of those militarists, those intelligence agents, those lobbyists like that. And, you know, in the case of Obama, uh, when he started making overtures to the Middle East, uh, in Israel, he was being denounced as, you know, a Muslim or as, you know, uh, as someone who's anti-Jewish or anti-Israeli. They were selling T-shirts with Obama's, uh, you know, face on and uh, with, with, with slogans denouncing him on. Uh, you know, they, they, there was a lot of propaganda against Obama. And he's, uh, he's first and foremost a politician, and he must understand that, you know, a fish needs water in which to swim. And the water in which Obama swims is that of the money of lobbyists and the Democrat Party has traditionally relied to a large extent on the money of uh, individuals who are partisan to Israel. You know, eight of the Jewish population in North America voted for the Democrats because Jew Jews are traditionally. And I think that we have to understand that there is a connection between the fact that, uh, you know, uh, a segment of the U.S. elite is prioritized. Mm. Of Israel. And I think, um, you know, William Emanuel who was a former, uh, who served in the Israeli Defense Force, whose father blew up David Hotel in Jerusalem, uh, and, and, and he was 
uh, you know, Barack Obama's right-hand man and brought in the most money f uh, for a Democrat uh, Party member, I believe, uh, Rob did. And, you know, th th this is the reality, that there's been um, an attempt on the, uh, among those who are sympathetic to Israel for the last three, three decades to conspire to make U.S. policy uh, continue to support Israel, where after the Cold War was over, it would be illogical for the U.S. to continue supporting Israel. In the Cold War, the United States recognized that Israel was a formidable fighting force after the Six-Day War in 1967, and therefore it had a confluence, a convergence of interests uh, with Israel. But after the Soviet Union collapsed and after the Cold War was over, the U.S. abandoned, for example, South Africa the racist white apartheid regime in South Africa, you know, up to, say, the mid-1980s, had served a function for the American empire, namely suppressing uh, uh, African self Angola, taking inexpedient for the empire to support a, a pariah state. It cast the apartheid white South African regime adrift, and its veto in the United Nations and so on dissipated. In the case of Israel, it was expedient for the United States to buttress that state in the context of the Cold War. But I don't see how, after uh, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, it was rational for the United States to support an ethnic nationalist state in the Middle East that alienates and estranges and angers those uh, Middle East leaders who the U.S. would surely have a vested interest in uh, cozying up to and pleasing and trying to do business and commercial dealings with. And it would appear to me that um, Israel and its supporters realized this uh, and, and, and tr basically, in my view, did 9-11 in order to, uh, uh, in order to uh, keep U.S. policy uh, welded to the Israeli state and pursuing the intervention that Israel wants it to pursue. And so I would argue that the, the main thing the United States people need to do is to... Take and is pursuing interests that are against the, the interests of it. That's not to say I would support the United States blackmailing countries in another way, but certainly um, not having bombs being dropped on the people of the Middle East should be our mm. priority. Mm. A few interesting points made there by uh, Mr. Blakeney, uh, Professor Mirandi, uh, drawing some, some comparisons with the apartheid regime also in South Africa. Of course, the apartheid regime ne never had the type of economic muscle and, and, and lobbying power uh, in the U.S. As, as the state of Israel has. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you know what, not, not, I believe, much um, sort of uh, uh, a possibility of, of, of America suddenly losing its interest in maintaining and supporting the the Israeli state. Um, so, so how do you think Iran is seeing this problem uh, in the next few years? Um, obviously, looking at the possibility of a military uh, sort of confrontation between Iran and Israel, one 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 hopes it never happens. Uh, but I'm sure Iran is is already looking at that as a possibility. How can this be avoided? Is there any way that this can be avoided? I mean, it, it doesn't seem like there's any other outcome to this uh, increased tension between Iran, uh, Israel, and supported by the U.S. Is there any way that Iran can act or you know, to, to safeguard itself and to steer this thing in a different direction, or must the world prepare for some sort of major military confrontation? Well, I think the Iranians um, have definitely prepared themselves for any aggression on behalf of um, Israel or by Israel itself. Uh, Israel itself, if, if it carries out any attack on Iran, uh, it would definitely be at the losing end because Iran has a very powerful missile deterrent. Mm -hmm. But and will they be able to meet a powerful. nuclear attack on, on 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 one of these cities or one or more of the cities? Well, obviously, if if you know if the if the Israeli regime uses a nuclear weapon, which would be the ultimate crime, mm -hmm. I think that uh, that would be legitimize it even in the eyes of its of its allies. Uh, there's no way that the American regime or the British or the French regime can justify support for for uh, the Israeli entity if it carries out such an attack. Um, and also I think that, um, that what is even more important is that the region is changing and uh, the United States recognizes this. And I think that this is partially to do the, the reason why the Americans are now behaving so harshly and so irrationally with regards to Iran. Uh, Egypt 
is uh, is now um, a completely different country than it was uh, a year ago. The people, uh, a huge group of people, if you recall, just a couple of months ago, went and took the Israeli embassy. I was at a conference just the other day here in Beirut, and a number of my colleagues from Egypt participated, and they were saying that the Egyptian people are adamant that Israel must cease to exist. And this is the sentiment that exists throughout the Middle East. So one of the, um, perhaps the most important thing for the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, is that these uh, uprisings are um, empowering uh, people, uh, hopefully in the future, to um, alter the, the balance of power in the region. And this itself will um, it be a great achievement for Iran in the sense that it will no longer be a lone voice in opposing Israel. For a short period of time, it seemed that Turkey would also stand alongside Iran. But unfortunately, it, it continues to be a part of NATO, and it continues to have relations with Israel. And I think it has been a bit of a disappointment. But it does seem that... Uh, what is going on in Egypt is a, is a major event, and uh, Egypt is, is the most important Arab country in the Middle East. And if a country like Jordan, for example, in the future uh, changes, then Israel will effectively be surrounded by uh, people who, who see it as it is, and has the meaning and a racist and illegitimate uh, colony of Western powers. So th the future, I think, for Israel is, is a very difficult one. And really the only solution, and obviously the Americans will not relinquish Israel, as you pointed out, and near the, near, nor will the Israelis relinquish um, Zionism. But the only way out of this is for Zionism as an ideology to be relinquished. Hmm. And uh, if um, Zionism, which means a chosen people or superior people, as long as that exists, there cannot be peace. And Israel's hmm. problem is not with Iran. Israel's problem is with humanity. It is with normal human beings, just like apartheid South Africa. Its problem was not just with South Africans. It was with Iranians, because they believed in some sort of racial hierarchy, which was unacceptable to the rest of us. Hmm. And so I think that the momentum is, uh, this mo anti-Israeli momentum is, is rapidly gaining ground. And at the same time, you see economic crises in Europe and the United States, which it seems uh, that the, these crises will become much greater in the future, mm. and it will hamper American uh, attempts to strengthen the Zionist regime. Mm. So I, I, I really believe that the ba balance of power is shifting away from Israel. Mm. Mr. Blagnit, do you agree that developments within the Arab countries, as well as developments within the United States, public discontent with the way the economy is going in Europe, also uh, mass action in Greece, etc. Uh, do you think those events, in the long run, um, when populations actually voice, uh, they, they, they raise their voice, uh, that that will in fact uh, make governments turn the um, you know t turn 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 the world away from this type of uh, you know tragedy you know tragedy for war etc oh well you know no one has a crystal ball and no one can really predict what the outcome will be i think if i were living in egypt i would try to remind myself every day when i wake up that this is an ongoing struggle that a revolution is not an event a revolution doesn't happen in a day a revolution is an unfolding process and I think that when we saw, for example, the Coptic churches blowing up in Egypt, that uh, the e Egyptian Lawyers Guild made a public statement alleging that, that Mossad had blown up those Coptic churches in order to foment uh, you know, sectarianism in Egypt and have Egyptians fighting each other rather than being uh, united to fight imperialism. And so I would hope that the Egyptians be educated enough and educate one another, mm. use the Internet, use the resources available, to, to realize that there is this policy being implemented in uh, Israeli documents where they've talked about trying to carve a Christian state out of Egypt, you know, mm. which is a buffer state to fight mm. against, uh, you know, Muslims in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of like they did in Lebanon. Some people use the phrase the Lebanonization of the Middle East or of Egypt, mm. uh, you know, where they use the Christian Fallujahs to fight the uh, other, other ethnic groups there. 
and religious groups in, in, in Lebanon. And so I think that we have to be very uh, cognizant of this reality. And I think the people of the Middle East need some unifying ideology. And if it's not going to be you know, uh, Arab nationalism or Islam, yeah. then maybe Islamism <laughs> could be that unifying force. And perhaps uh, Iran will offer that, you know, will offer that, that, that beachhead for the peoples of the Middle East to unify uh, mm -hmm. under a common ideology to resist imperialism. Uh, as for Israel, I, I think that uh, it is different to South Africa, as you noted, in that the, uh, you know, the, the South Africans didn't have this network of lobbyists that were, you know, had infested the British Parliament into the U.S. political system, in the French political system, uh, and, and but there is an increasing uh, disconnect. You know, it used to be where the uh, people of, of 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 the West were highly sympathetic with Israel, and the government sort of had a non-partisan position, but increasingly the governments of the Western world are siding with Israel very one-sidedly, but the people of the U.S. and Britain and, uh, and France and, and, and Germany are, are increasingly taking an anti-Zionist position. There was a poll from the BBC recently that indicated that more than 50% of the U.S. people uh, think Israel has a negative influence on the United States, you know. And so it, it's not necessarily true that the U.S. people completely think of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to see how the governments are increasingly taking a very extreme view Deciding with, you know, not just Israel, but the Israeli hard right, who are even unpopular among some Israelis. Uh, and, and, and yet the people of, of, of Britain and Canada and the U.S., and many people are, are beginning to take a uh, position sympathetic to the Palestinians, sympathetic to the, the broader uh, pop populace of the Middle East, which I think is uh, a positive thing. Uh -huh. Gentlemen, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it this evening. Our time May is I up. just make one sentence? Yes, please. Say, say one thing. Yes. I just would like to say that I think that there is one major threat in the region, and that is uh, div uh, dividing people among ethnic, religious, and sectarian grounds. Mm. And unfortunately, I think that the dictatorships in, in the Persian Gulf, meaning Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, they are promoting extremist ideologies. Mm in order to divide people, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in any other part of the, of the region. Mm. And I think that they're doing this as a part of a broader counter-revolution to prevent the people of the region from uniting with one another, basically for self-preservation. But if you've noticed, this, uh, this extremism that's being exported by these countries is something that the United States has always closed its mm. eyes to. Yeah. which makes it very suspicious. Yeah, and, and of concern, of course, also, just a quick uh, one, uh, just to follow up on what you're mentioning, is that the new governments that have come in into power in Libya, uh, Egypt also, you know, the, the Juan in Tunisia, also signs and comments from the leaders of these new governments like Rashid Khanoushi that uh, they certainly don't prioritize the issue of, 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 palace, of the Palestinians. Um, uh, and also, sadly, this, the, the, the signs that they there were movement of troops, of, of uh, freelance uh, mercenaries from Libya to Syria to support uh, the, uh, you know, the violent uh, resistance to the government there. Uh, so uh, I think a bit more complicated also the developments in, the, in these Arab countries and I wish we could have more time to maybe explore how this will pan out. Um, and again, I'm very sorry for interrupting. Mm. I think there are a couple of good articles on this on the, the, the Conflicts Forum website, conflictsforum.org, as well as uh, good articles by uh, the Leverets mm. um, on rageforiran.com with regards to U.S. policy in the Middle East and also what's going on in Syria and in other countries. These are, uh, uh, there, there are other good websites, but these are two came to mind. And I agree. But I do think that the people of the region, regardless of the elites, the people of the region recognize that Israel is the number one problem. And hopefully in the long term, uh, they will force politicians to move in the direction to recognize this mm. prob that this problem must be resolved. Mm. Mr. Blakeney, any last comments from your side before we wrap up this evening? No, oh, I'd just like to say, you know, it's been an honor and a privilege uh, to be on your radio show and to be a co-guest to a highly esteemable professor. I, I really respect Professor Morandi and think that his analysis Thank you very is much. very important. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think your analysis also, Mr. Blakeney, it's been very, you know, on, on, on the nail there. And I think we've certainly benefited uh, greatly from your um, comments on, on, on this, this issue. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. 
Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank just, you so much. Just to wrap up our program this evening, um, we have a little snippet here. Iran has decided to respond to America's request to return its spy drone which the Islamic Republic downed last year. Um, they've, re they've decided to return this drone. But the only thing is that the one that they will be sending back to the White House will be a scaled down toy version, which is now also being sold on the Iranian market. The model craft is going for around 30 Rand. The marketing of the model is a cheeky response by Iran to, requ to the request from America, uh, from the President of America, Barack Obama, to return the spy drone. I think it's more of an audacity of Obama to ask that the drone be returned and it's a very, very fitting response of Iran to return the drone but not the real drone, just a toy version of the drone. Okay, so we're going to have to wrap up the program this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the um, comments and the insights that were provided by our excellent guests, uh, Professor Mohammed Mirandi from Lebanon. Also, he's actually from Lebanon, I mentioned earlier, he's from Iran. Um, also, freelance journalist, uh, Mr. Joshua Blakeney, which gave us an excellent insight into the tension between Iran and uh, Zionist Israel and America. Just to mention to you quickly, the, the disclaimer, the views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Radio 786, its management or staff. We're going to have to wrap it up there. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Until we meet again next time, this is Anwar Sheikh. The program this evening was produced by Rukeya Syria. Uh, also, the technical production was from Ashraf Van Witt. Shukran for joining us this evening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Prime Talk, discerning, dissenting, tackling the crux of the conflicts and the controversies, dealing with the perspectives, the personalities and the politics. Prime Talk. Radio 786, 100.4 FM Stereo.